Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chairman, for inviting me to speak to your group today. And, and I did get a chance to meet um, most of you, I think, this morning and say hello. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about my background and, and what I'm going to talk about uh, today. I have a mechanical engineering degree from LSU. And I went to work after that for a Shell Oil Company. Uh, and ma managed really many deep water major assets for the company in the Gulf of Mexico. And one of the great things about um, working for a company like that in corporate America, and they were the number one company on the Fortune 500 list at that time. One of the great things about being able to do that is they had a tremendous training program, both in terms of technical training but more importantly, they believed in training and investing in people. And so I had an opportunity to um, be trained by some of the best people in the world in terms of management and, and leadership skills and people skills. And I will tell you that the, the single most impactful thing that I ever did and ever had the opportunity to do was to meet a gentleman by the name of Stephen Covey. And he wrote a book, and I hope that maybe some of you have heard of this. It's called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. This was written in 1990, and it's considered probably one of the top ten books in the history of the world in terms of leadership skills. And so I was fortunate enough to go through training with him directly. And it was so un impactful. To, to me and the other executives that went through that training that we decided that everyone in the company should go through this training and should get a copy of this book. And so what I um, hope to do with you today is to give you kind of a high level summary of this book because I think it is transformational in terms of pointing out kind of the habits of the most successful leaders in the world. And I hope that uh, this will be something that will be as much of a benefit to you as it was to me, and still is, as a matter of fact, not just in my business world, but in my personal life as well. Okay, so I'm going to um, start. I have a little PowerPoint. So the, the name of this book, as I mentioned earlier, is called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And Stephen Covey, um, this is sort of an overview, he talks about uh, kind of the different phases that you go through in your life. So when you're first born, you obviously you're, you're dependent for everything. So when you're a baby, you depend on people to clothe you, to feed you, everything. You're completely dependent. And then you grow into a phase called independence, where you can do things for yourself, right? You can feed yourself, you're able to make decisions. And then, then you will move into a phase called interdependence. And that's where you work with other people. That's kind of the teamwork phase of things, where you're working within a family or a group, and you're working collaboratively. So he has seven habits that he describes. The first three are those on the left side of the slide, and those deal with working on yourself as an individual person. He talks about being from the inside out. The next three habits have to do with really the outside. It's working with other people. It's the collaborative teamwork public aspect of development. And then surrounding all of that is his seventh habit, which he calls sharpening the saw. And um, I'll talk about each of those in a few minutes. So what's a habit? A habit is really the intersection of knowledge, that's what to do, the skills, how to do it, and the desire that, the, that, that you want to do it. And when you put those three things together, you will create a habit. 
So the first habit is called be proactive. And that, he describes it as being kind of the opposite of, of reactive. So for example, if a, a droplet of water dropped in the lake, you would see a ripple effect from that stimulus, the drop. And the reaction to that drop or that pebble is measured and, and it's appropriate for the stimulus. And then everything kind of dies out, right? The waves, the little ripple, it, it kind of dies out and everything is smooth sailing again. The opposite of that is, is reactive. So Covey talks about the fact that you can choose how you react to a stimulus. So you can choose your attitude. You can choose to be happy. You can choose how you react when someone cuts you off in traffic or someone says something that you view as being disrespectful. You get to choose how you react to that. A proactive person um, a proactive person reacts in a positive way, right, that's measured and it's appropriate for the, for the event. A reactive person overreacts, like a can of Coke that you shake up that explodes. Okay, that's a reactive person. A leader is proactive. So you look at the difference between proactive and reactive. Think about your circle of influence. Those are, that's the inner circle. Those are the things that you can control. Your circle of influence. The circle of concern are those things that are outside of your control. You can't control the weather, right? So why complain about it? There are many things you can't control the traffic. Those of you that are from Baton Rouge, you deal with that every day, okay? But focus on the things that you can control and the things that are within your circle of influence. And the more you focus on those things, the more you will be able to expand your circle of influence and minimize those other things in that circle of concern. The second habit he calls begin with the end in mind. So this is like a road, right? Then you can think about this as a trip. If you have no idea where you're going, how do you know how to get there? And how are you going to know when you arrive? OK, so let's do something real quick. I want, you to, uh, I want you to close your eyes, and I want everyone to point in the direction of north. One, two, three. Everybody point north. All right, now keep your hands up and open your eyes and look around. Of course, we're all pointing in different directions, right? So the idea is if you don't know where you're going, you're, you're not going to get there. So a leader will begin with the end in mind. So this is where you talk about goal setting and your personal mission statement, those things. You decide where it is that you want to go, and then you lay in the action steps to get there. So suppose you want to make the football team. Well, you're not going to just walk out there one day and make the team, right? You know that you have to be in the gym and you have to be working out and you have to be practicing and doing all those things that you need to be successful. Or maybe you want to be, you know, president of your student class or you want to be valedictorian or whatever. All of those things require a plan to get there. So begin with the end in mind. Figure out what your goals are, where you want to go, and then put the steps in place to get there, and you'll be amazed at the things that you'll accomplish when you do that. The third habit uh, I really like, and it's called put first things first. So, you know, you're bombarded as, uh, as students in high school. I know that you are bombarded with lots and lots of things to do. And sometimes it can be challenging to figure out where to best spend your time. I mean, you all are on this council because you're, you're extraordinary and you were viewed by those that selected you as being leaders. And as leaders, I'm quite certain that you all are involved in lots and lots of things at school and in your community. And so sometimes you probably feel like you're pulled in a lot of different directions. So Covey likes to describe all of the work as being in, in one of four quadrants. So 
Let's start with, um, let's say, quadrant four. Those are things that are not urgent and they're not important. Well, what would be some examples of those? These are the things that we know are all like huge time wasters and we all get caught up in these. Maybe it's spending time on Facebook, right? Or watching TV kind of brainlessly, right? It's all those things that don't really matter. They're just kind of mind numbing and they're time killers. And there's lots of those. And you could spend your whole day doing those things and you'll look back at the end of the day and you'll say, gosh, I didn't really accomplish anything, but you felt like you were being busy. And the opposite of that is quadrant one. Those are things that are urgent and important. Those are the things you have to do and you have to do them now. So it could be things, any kind of a crisis obviously, or an emergency of some sort, any kind of pressing problem, or something that's a big deadline. So if you have your senior project due tomorrow, of course that is going to be your top priority today, right? And so those are things that are urgent and important and you've got to do them and you don't really have any choice. It's going to always sort of feel like a fire drill though if you're always operating in quadrant one. Quadrant two is where you really want to be. So quadrant two, these are things that are important, but they're not urgent. So think about it as being like that senior project that's due at the end of the semester. If you wait till the weekend before it's due, you're gonna be in quadrant one, aren't you? Okay, but if you start early in September and you're working on it and you have a little bit of a plan and you're making progress, then you're working in quadrant two. And there's an awful lot less pressure and stress in quadrant two than when you're operating in quadrant one. So it's easy though, if you don't do your job in quadrant two, then all of a sudden everything becomes quadrant one, doesn't it? Everything's in your crisis mode and it's very stressful. And it doesn't give you the opportunity to really plan and feel like you're in control of your schedule and in your life. So quadrant two, those are things that are Again, it could be even things like exercise. You know, you're not gonna be fit because you go and exercise one day. It's a long-term habit, right? So put in the steps to do that over the long-term. But all of those long-term projects are quadrant two. Building relationships, those are all things you have to invest in steadily over a period of time. Those are all quadrant two things. Quadrant three, those are things that are a little bit more difficult too because they, there is some urgency to them, but they're not really important. So it could be, and sometimes you don't know that. So suppose your mom calls. Well, you probably will answer the phone. And it could be she's telling you that the house is burning down and you need to come home right away and that would be, that would be quadrant one, wouldn't it? You'd drop everything and you would go. But it could be she's calling just to sort of check in and see how your day's going. And that turns out that's maybe not really as important. And so there's a lot of those things where you can feel like you're kind of making progress and you're doing some things that might feel like they're urgent, but they're really not that important. So the idea is to make some conscious choices about the work that you're choosing to do and to push as many of your things into quadrant two and focus on the important things and don't focus and don't spend any time on the unimportant things. That's what effective leaders do. Habit four is think win-win. And you all know what that means. It, it's, it's if you and I were negotiating a deal and it was good for you and it was good for me. So some of the opposites of that, of course, lose, lose, who would ever want to do that? Or suppose I win and you lose, well I feel great and you feel pretty crummy about the deal and that's not really a good thing from a long term standpoint. And, and oh, let's do lose, I lose, you win. Well that's not really a good thing either. The absolute best is what they call win-win or no deal. So that would be my commitment to say I'm, I'm not looking for win-lose or even win-win. I'm only going to do the deal if I can win and you can win. And if, if we can't both win and it be a good thing for both of us, then we're not going to do the deal at all. 
And that's how you build sort of long-term relationships because we're going to both feel good about where we are and we're both going to want to continue to work together. And that's what real leaders do. Habit five, seek first to understand and then to be understood. So this is a hard thing for some of us because human nature is you want people to understand what your position is, right? You want everyone to know what your thoughts are. And sometimes when other people are talking, you're not really listening because you're so busy thinking about what you're going to say next. But what effective leaders do is they do seek to understand the other person's position first. And they listen empathetically. Basically what that means is you're really dialed in. You're really listening to what they have to say. You are, you are really interested in knowing their thoughts. Now the opposite of that would be if you and I were having a conversation and the whole time you're talking, I'm looking around, I'm looking over your shoulder at who's the next person I'm going to talk to or who's more important in the room that I want to go talk to. And how does that make you feel? That makes you feel like you don't really matter to me, right? And so they talk about, Covey talks about the emotional bank account. So if I'm listening to you and I'm seeking to understand you, and I'm listening with an empathetic ear, I'm really concerned and I'm really very interested in what you have to say, then I am making deposits in your emotional bank account. So what does that mean? That means, well, you're going to walk away from that conversation. You're going to say, man, that Sharon Hewitt is pretty awesome. I really like her. And why is that? It's because, one, I really did show an interest in what you had to say and you got to talk about your favorite topic, which is, which is you, right? Everybody likes to, to be heard and likes, likes to, to talk about themselves. And I gave you that opportunity. Now the converse, when I talked about it, if I'm talking with you and I'm looking over your shoulder and I, I'm not really very interested in what you're saying, then that is like a negative, isn't it? And so I'm making a withdrawal from the emotional bank account, from your emotional bank account when I'm doing that. So seek first what leaders, effective leaders do. They seek first to understand and then to be understood. And it makes it so much easier to find a win-win, doesn't it? When you've already understood the other person's point of view and you know what your point of view is, so you've kind of got all the information now to develop a win-win that you believe would be good for the other person because you really understood their point. And, and, and then you can develop something that's a true win-win. If you haven't spent the time invested in understanding their point of view, how are you ever going to get there to a win-win? Because you have no idea what their thoughts are. You didn't spend any time investing in that. The sixth habit is called synergize. So this is the idea that uh, one plus one equals three. We're all better when we work together as a team, right? The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Now, to, to synergize and to be really effective with this, communication is critical. And so there's all different levels of communication. The lowest level are those in kind of a low trust situation. And the evidence of those that you'll see is where people will uh, put a lot of things in writing. There'll be a lot of lawyers involved. It's kind of a lot of CYA. So you're not really communicating. You're sort of putting things out there and, and uh, communicating and writing. I'm not saying that all communication and writing is bad because it's good to document and leave a paperwork trail, but it shouldn't be your primary form of communication. The second level, the mid-level, is where most of us operate most of the time. It's respectful communication. But the third level is what you aspire to do and that's win-win communication. So in a win-win communication situation, we're working together, we're talking together, we're communicating as a team, and not so much like in the low trust situation where you're more in an adversarial role. So the last habit 
It's called Sharpening the Saw. And uh, Covey gives a lot of great stories in his book. And one of the stories that I really enjoy is this story about an old man and a younger man. And they're working together chopping some wood. And so they're, you know, they're side by side. And the old man has his pile of wood that he's chopped. And the younger man has his pile of wood. And every time the young man looks over at the old man, the old man appears to be sitting down and resting. But yet the old man's pile of wood was taller than the young man's pile. Well, it finally got away with the young man, and he said, what's up? I mean, how are you doing that? I'm over here, you know, sweating like a dog, and every time I look over, you're resting. And the old man said, I'm not resting. I'm sharpening my saw. Because when your saw is sharper, you cut the wood faster. Right? So you don't have to work as hard cutting the wood as you do when you have a dull blade. So sharpening the saw means working on yourself. It's sharpening your saw so that you're more effective in what you do. And so how are some of the ways that you do that? Well, again, Covey likes to think uh, in quadrants. So the, one, the first quadrant is the physical aspects. Sharpening your saw, you're getting regular exercise, and you're eating well, and you're sleeping well, and you're relaxing. And we all know this intuitively, don't we? You feel better when you're eating right, and you're exercising, you're doing all those things. Every, you're on your game. Everything seems to be better when you're rested, and you're, you're, doing your, you're doing your best because physically you feel good. There's mental aspects to sharpening the saw. That's basically learning, that's reading, that's writing, that's learning new skills, that's exposing your brain and your mind, it's exercising your mind. And those are things that are really important to sharpening your saw. There's the social emotional aspects of sharpening your saw. That has to do with relationships, service, community, activities. And then the last one is, is feeding your soul. That could be praying, going to church, meditating, all of those things where kind of self-reflection and thinking about the things that are important to you and kind of where you are. So the seven habits, when you can do all of these things, and I will tell you it's not something that you like do one week and you check it off the list, it's something that you constantly have to be working towards. Uh, but I can tell you that it, it can uh, make a huge impact in your life, and I believe that it has made a huge impact in my life. So the seven habits, just to re re refresh, be proactive, choose how you react in situations, don't be reactive. Begin with the end in mind, know where you're going and have a plan. Put first things first, that means the most important things, do those first, quadrant one and quadrant two. Think win-win. Seek first to understand others and then to be understood. Synergize. Work as a team, knowing that, the, that what the team can do is better than what each of us individually can accomplish. And then always be thinking about sharpening your saw. So I have a... Um, a little demonstration that I would like to do now and see if you all were um, paying attention. All right, so I need one brave volunteer that can come down and, and, um, and help me with this. Anybody like to come, come down and help me? Okay, all right, young man. All right, why don't you sit right here? All right, so why don't you introduce yourself for us again. Tell us your name. I'm Micah Diggs, and I'm from Assumption Parish. Okay. And uh, tell me some of the things that you're involved in in, uh, in school and in your community. I'm involved in Student Council, 4-H, National Honor Society. I'm on the tennis team. And that's pretty much it at school. I'm a volunteer. In my community, I volunteer a lot. I do a lot of service projects with the uh, Donaldsonville Mayor's Youth Advisory Council, which I'm a part of. Well, it sounds like you have a pretty full plate. I do. And you'll be a rising junior? 
I'll right. be a senior this a year. A senior, a rising senior. Okay. So you're getting ready to transition from high school to college. Is that something that you're planning on doing? Yes, ma'am. All right. And so you'll be going through all the application process and everything yes, I'll this be semester? Next week, really, with applying. Okay. And do you work at all? Do you have? Did you have any kind of job yes, this summer? I do summer? have a job. You I do? work at Big Ben's Rent World. Okay, so you sound like a pretty busy young man. All right, so does it ever feel to you like this? I'm gonna give you a little demo here. All right, so Micah, am I saying it right? Yes, ma'am. Micah, okay. So Micah, this is, this is your life, okay. right? like thousands of things going on. You just describe them to me, right? Okay. Lots and lots of things. Lots of things that want Micah's time and Micah's attention. Okay. Now, but there are some really important things in your life and you talked about some of those already. Okay, so what I would like for you to do this is your life, and these are all the little things that, that will distract you and uh, things that some of them are important, but there's also some really big things that are important. And so what I would like for you to do is to get all of these big things into your life. Okay, now you can't go above the top of the bucket, okay, but I want you to get all those important things into your life and as you put them in the bucket you can select them in any order you want and as you put them in the bucket I'm gonna read out to the rest of the group what you're uh, what, what you're putting in the bucket okay so I have to put all of them where I can pick you have to put all of them in mm -hmm. okay. in any order you want however you want <laughs> alright so that's education that's important and employment mentioned he has a job that's important vacation <laughs> I like what he's choosing so far what was that community church and service that's important And that is Q1. Remember what that is? Quadrant one, those are the important and urgent things. And there's Q2, longer term planning. There's what, was that major projects? It probably has a major project or two to do. Big opportunity, major projects about to. Okay, you're you're close. <laughs> Definitely want this one. He wants to sharpen the saw, but he's having a hard time squeezing that in. <laughs> Y'all ever have trouble with that? And his relationships and family didn't make the cut. <laughs> okay, so it's hard, isn't it, when you have lots of little things going on? to make sure that you get the big things done. Okay, so what if I told you that you could shift your paradigm, okay? Now I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do this however you want, okay? But you can start out now with this fresh bucket, like a clean slate in your life. You have a clean slate. And you still have to get all the big things and the little things done but I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do them perhaps in a different order. Okay. So we're doing a reboot.
Okay. So first he's going to sharpen the saw and take care of his family and his relationships, which, you know, they didn't make the cut the last time. And then there's the Q2, big pro, uh, major, you know, planning. And that's community service and church. That's important to Micah. Got a vacation in there. That's got to get in there. Major project. Q1, those are urgent and important. Pretty much have to have those, don't you? Big opportunity. Education. And employment. Got to pay the bills. some of those little chores that he was supposed to be taking care of. Yeah, those don't matter. he's clearly trying to squeeze in all the little things that he can pack into his life. That's a good thing. And he's very neat about how he organizes his life. I like that about you, Micah. How about that? <laughs> All right. I think we'll call that close enough. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's see, Micah. So tell me, what, what did you learn from this exercise? Mm. Some things aren't important, but I learned. And some things that don't seem, that they're, don't seem like they're that important, you do want to squeeze in. And like the big things, like the major projects, you want them, and like vacation, you think, oh, I don't really need that, but in the end, who doesn't like a vacation? <laughs> <laughs> and not the little things, they take up a lot of space. They do. But the only way it really works is when you put the first things first, right? You put the big things in your life in first. And all the little stuff can kind of fill in. Yeah. But it only works when you put the big things in first, right? Excellent. All right, let's give Micah a hand. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so I have, uh, that was great, Micah. Thank you for um, helping me with that. You're a good sport.
Okay, so I have one thing to kind of wrap up here with you, and that is to tell you that, um, that I have a book for each of you. And, uh, you know, I can't think of anything better for me to invest in than the future leaders of our community and our state. And uh, I hope that you will use this book as the very first step in sharpening your saw, right, and, and do what you can do to becoming an effective leader in your school and in your community. So I loved being here. I appreciate you all, and thank you all for giving me a chance to talk to you about something that I really believe in. Thank you all very much.